Well, hello. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Around the Town with Mark. I am Mark Whalen, your host, and you know that we are always happy to have you tune in and visit with us. Well, today I have a very, very special guest, a very dear old-time friend of mine, and somebody that's very, very accomplished in very many ways, sort of like a Renaissance man, really. <laughs> um, and he's here today to talk primarily about his experience sailing. And uh, if you watched, and I hope you did, my last Nibbling Around Town show, uh, it was all about sailing in the Mediterranean and eating off the land. Well, this is the skipper of that vessel, and I was with him for that, that trip. So allow me to introduce Bill Sturant. Bill, welcome to Around the Town with Mark. Thank you, Mark. Nice to be with you. Well, it's nice to be with you. It's, so, it's sort of kind of, as we spoke before we went on camera, here we've been friends for a long time, and who would have thunk that <laughs> <laughs> we were going to be sitting here in front of a camera talking? But this is great. My life has always taken unexpected turns, um, so okay. this doesn't phase me, and I'm happy to be here. Oh, great. Well, super. I love it. I love it. So give us a little bit of background about just who is Bill Sturant. Well, I uh, was educated at uh, the Juilliard School in New York and trained as a musician, worked as a freelance musician for several years in New York, doing Broadway shows, Radio City Music Hall, jingles, playing on all the monkeys' tunes for a couple of years, Archie's tunes, Juilliard Contemporary Chamber Ensemble. And then it seemed like it was time to move out of New York, become a hippie in northern Vermont, build a geodesic dome in the woods with an outhouse, which I did and lived in for 12 years. And uh, since that house only cost $4,000, even though I wasn't making very much money, that enabled me to commission the building of a 33-foot sailboat. Aha. Uh -huh which is the boat that you sailed on so many times in the Mediterranean. Yeah, yeah. I think we have a picture of the sailboat, uh, Clarity, which um, uh, we'll have on the screen in a moment. There we go. Um, That's a picture of Clarity in Croatia, uh -huh. which is where our cruising grounds are now. Uh, the boat spends every winter in a boatyard at the top of the Adriatic in Italy, and then we scrub the bottom launch the boat and sail one afternoon and we're in Croatian waters for wow. the rest of the cruise, which is usually about five weeks. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. And it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful boat. Tell us a little bit more about the construction. And, and I know the, the builder of the boat was sort of a, a friend of yours. And the designer and builder of the boat was an old friend. Uh, he was an architect who also was a marine architect and we met because he was also a surveyor of boats, meaning he would inspect them for sale or uh, for repairs and that sort of thing. And he had designed a cruising boat, and I was looking for a cruising boat, and he had never built a boat before, so he needed oh, uh -huh. somebody to take a chance on him. So I knew him well enough to know that anything he did, he did with excellence. So I commissioned the boat. Uh, it took two years to build and was launched in 1980. So this coming summer will be her 40th anniversary cruise. Oh, wow, fantastic. Happy birthday, Clarity. <laughs> yeah. We sailed across the Atlantic in 1988, and the boat has been in Europe ever since. I've, I've taught at Yale for 25 years, so I always had the summers off and I was free to go over and scrub the bottom and do the varnish work. And, and then my partner, Brian, would show up for his two weeks of cruising. And in between, other friends would come and join me. And that's and how you came to be aboard on a number of cruises. Yeah, and it was always an exotic, wonderful treat to And I, I used to enjoy all of it. The scrubbing the bottom and painting the bottom of the boat was was just part of that experience of, of being in that arena. And uh, so it, it, even the, you know, all of it was glamorous. Even, even yeah. cleaning the boat <laughs> up was great because the anticipation of launching it was always exciting. 
There are things about the cruising life that seem so idyllic, uh, you know, being the only boat in an anchorage as the sun goes down and hearing the cicadas in the pine trees beginning to quiet down as night comes on. But there are also uh, bureaucratic adventures that are certainly memorable to me. Uh, when we arrived in Scotland in 1988, uh, the EU had not actually come together yet. It was still called the European Community. So we left the boat in Scotland for a winter, then sailed to the Mediterranean the next summer, and began a series of summers, 17 summers it turned out, in the south of France. And each year we would take the boat's U.S. document to the customs authorities in the local town where the boatyard was, and leave it with them, and they would say thank you very much, and when we got back the next year, we would go to the office and ask for the document, and they would give it back. Mm -hmm. And we were thinking, I read somewhere that you can only keep a non-EU boat in the EU for 18 months, and then you have to leave. Oh. And somehow, they know we're here, because we keep giving them a document and they never kick us out. So maybe we've grandfathered this whole thing. But no. I was thinking, highly unlikely for a government. One winter, in the middle of the winter, we got a letter forwarded from the boatyard to us, a letter from French Customs saying, you have to get the boat out of here now because you've overstayed the Aye. limit. Aye. So I called the boatyard and in my weak French, said to the boatyard manager, what, what should I do? And she was furious with the customs people. She said, I'll take care of this. So she called them up and said, how dare you try to intimidate my customer of many years? And I said, okay, okay, sorry. We'll back off and let, really? let them stay till summer. Oh, wow. That's so... Four or five months later, I showed up with all the paperwork for commissioning the boat and showing how much I had paid for the boat and all the other documentation and cranked my French up to warp speed to deal with French bureaucrats for, for a solid week. And we imported the boat into the EU and paid value added tax on the value of the boat wow. and got a document handwritten, the first one they had ever completed wow. for this purpose, that's called a passport for a foreign vessel. And this means Clarity can stay in Europe forever. Forever. Okay. So now as we're winding down our years, I'm 72, we're not sure when we want to stop sailing, but we're beginning to think about passing the boat on to someone. That uh, passport for a foreign vessel passes along with the boat. Oh, fantastic. So for any American sailor who is interested in uh, that feature of being able to sail in Europe as long as you want, that becomes a really important document. Oh. So we learn as we go along. <laughs> well, I'm glad we don't have your phone number up there or you <laughs> should be starting to get calls. Can I buy the boat? Can I buy the boat? <laughs> well, people can get in touch with you if they want to inquire about that. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, 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 I'll You'll screen feel them well I'll, yeah, for you. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I, I know from being on the boat, she's, she's beautiful. Well, inside, thank you. Inside and out, is, she's truly a... a special boat. You can tell that she was built with and designed with love and care because it's, it's not your ordinary sailboat yeah. by any means. She's shown us many thousands of miles of cruising. Before we sailed across the Atlantic, we spent a year cruising from the Canada main border all the way down to Trinidad and back. Mm. My partner Brian was born in Trinidad even though he's a Scottish uh, He's Scottish by family, mm -hmm. but it so happened that his father was posted to Trinidad at the time he was born. 
So we had to go back to Trinidad for Carnival. That was oh, sort of okay. the end destination and turning point of that year in the Caribbean. And it was something I'll never forget. Oh, I was going to say, it's, with all the experiences you've had, that's, that's got to be up on the, up at the top. Yeah. yeah. And the weather in Scotland is also uh, memorable. Uh, first of all, we, we... Not so much in a good way, I'm, I'm assuming. No. <laughs> no, we spent 28 days sailing across the Atlantic. Uh, How was that experience, let me just jump in, on a boat that size? Well, actually, that's not an unusual size of boat for crossing no. the okay. Atlantic. Uh, okay. And the boat was designed and built to go anywhere in any weather. Right. Uh, she's extremely strongly built. That said, we did encounter a horrendous historic storm with 90 mile an hour winds uh, for two days, uh, 375 miles off the Irish coast. And uh, that storm laid waste to marinas all along the south mm. coast of Ireland and caused uh, a couple of ships to sink. And wow. it was a traumatic experience wow. for me. Not for Clarity. She was doing just fine, oh, thank she... you very much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I was uh, lying on the berth down in the cabin waiting for the storm to go away. That's what you do. You, you don't sit out in the cockpit holding on to the tiller. You just yeah. set the boat up so that the sails are trying to head the boat off downwind and the rudder is trying to steer the boat up into the wind and those two counteract each other and you end up pointing about 45 degrees into the waves so you're not hitting them dead head on. You're also not running before them. You're just sort of uh, bounding. You're not moving either, except very little bit sideways. And then you just sit down below and wait for the storm to go past you. And turn green, and <laughs> no matter where on the boat you go, <laughs> there's really no no better place. I, I remember the one time uh, you and I were traveling um, and we were going by, was it Cap Ferrat? Is that where the big yeah. hotel is? Where yeah. I? And you and I were just green. It was rocking and rolling and cabinets were opening and dishes flying out and you and I are just, and people are up there in, the, in their lounge chairs by the pool, just <laughs> like it was just a normal day. Here we are. They're probably thinking, oh, look at that lucky sailor. And we're just like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think my, my, I was wobbly for two days after that. Well, that's often a feeling that I have when we've been out in high winds, that we finally make it to a safe harbor and everybody's just living their lives. They're sitting in cafes and you know, sipping their espresso, and I'm thinking, don't you know what it's doing out don't there? Don't you know what I've just been through? <laughs> don't you realize that I've just been tossed all over the place? So uh, I'll just mention... Yes, uh, I was just going to say, please mention the book you wrote about your crossing. This is uh, a, a book called Outbound, which is a memoir about the, the voyage across the Atlantic, but also uh, with flashbacks that sort of sketch in the story of how I went from being a straight boy to being a gay man mm -hmm. and ended up in the middle of the ocean with my partner Brian. That's why the title is Outbound. Well, it's, it's a perfect title. because <laughs> It really is because, yeah, here you are accomplishing a lot of major points in your life. Sort of accomplishes, the title accomplishes uh, a picture of heading out to sea, but also heading, heading out, out as a man. Heading out in your personal life and your yeah. and realizing who and what you are at the same time. I think that's terrific. Yeah. So that's. So tell me a little bit more. I mean, I know, you know, you and I have had many cruises and a lot of fun, and and remember a couple times like. Eating the wrong muscle uh, in a cafe <laughs> might not be too too good or something like that. But generally speaking, it's it's uh, like I had in that show, eating off the land and going into the local market and 
getting just all that beautiful food that you used to be able to get on the market. Yeah. One thing you learn cruising summer after summer in the south of France is which day of the week there's a farmer's market and where because the farmer's market is kind of a movable feast that moves along from town to town during the days of the week. So if we're in Cassis, then Monday is the day when we'll be able to get uh, the, that cheese that we love and those mm -hmm. olives that we love. But if we don't make it on Monday because of the weather or whatever reason, then La Ciota will have the same market available the next day. Mm -hmm. So we just plan it that way. It's, I remember one time uh, when I was with you at a market and we, we each picked out a, a peach. And I, this, for some reason this just sticks in my mind because I thought it was so much fun. And we, we just went to the, the a fountain that was nearby and we just sort of washed the peach in the fountain and just enjoyed this, this wonderful peach that you just don't get everywhere in life. And it's that type of experience that makes yeah, that's so much fun. It's a very uh, sensual life. I remember you and I used to get on the matala, which is the French word for an air mattress. We would each have one, yes. and we would just throw them over the side and then jump in and climb on them and paddle all over the anchorage just looking at all the beautiful boats. And oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Passing the afternoon that way. Oh, and look, looking up at some of the, the villas, like um, what was the one that what we used to call the um, Emirs, was it? Oh, and this is in Cap Ferrat. Cap Ferrat, which, that which, had the, you could see the Rolls Royces driving, and they had, they had the, the you'd peacocks see the in the lawns. Peacocks, and you'd see the owner walking around the grounds in his thobe, you know, his uh, Middle Eastern sort of gown uh, with his head wrap. So yes, we always called that anchorage the Amirs. I have no idea whether he was an Amir or just a, an oil executive. But, but it was a very <laughs> exotic picture. Um, and every year we used to buy the Boat International uh, Summer Issue. With, this is a ma glossy magazine that would have the hundred biggest yachts in the world. And we would just bring it along in our luggage and have it on board and just sort of check them off as we saw them sailing around in the area between Saint-Tropez and Nice and Villefranche where we were sailing at the time. I remember, and I'm trying to remember the name of the boat right now and it's not coming to me, but you might remember. We looked out and we were going into an anchorage, a small anchorage, and I remember bemoaning, oh no, there's a cruise ship here. The little <laughs> town is going to be overrun with these cruise ship passengers, Lady Mora. Oh. And, and it wasn't a cruise ship. It, it, it was a, a personal yacht. A 350-foot yacht with a crew of 30, uh, all just to take care of the family exactly. that, that and, owned it and, from Saudi Arabia. And so often you would, you would see them with with not just the boat, but they would have a helicopter on, on them. They would have smaller boats. They would have the Rolls Royce hoisted up and put somewhere. And then uh, some of those boats with Middle East uh, Muslim owners would have a, a gorgeous tender for taking the passengers ashore if the boat was at anchor. And sometimes the tender would be a classic varnished launch with a enclosed varnished cabin with curtains so that no one could see yep. the women passengers as they were being conveyed to the shore. Oh, yeah. Exotic yeah. little details. Oh, yes, yes. And, and if, if uh, somebody was entertaining one yacht, uh, they were entertaining and you could hear the party going on and there was a, a gentleman who was greeting and the passengers and in some kind of this very formal French um, outfit with waistcoat and and yeah it's 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 a different life. Mm -hmm. Croatia is very different from the south of France and it's kind of a sailor's paradise. It's 
1,500 islands spread out over mm -hmm. 300 miles and hundreds and hundreds of anchorages. You can be the only boat in the anchorage every night if that's what you prefer. Or you can be in a companionable little anchorage with 20 other boats. Or you can be in a marina with 500 other boats. And you can pretty much choose at any point in your cruise which of, which of those you prefer. And many of the larger islands have ancient towns that are 500 years old with all stone buildings. And, and sometimes you'll be sailing along past a, an island that's now uninhabited, mm. but the entire island is gridded with stone walls that are six feet thick. Wow. And that was just in order to get rid of enough stones so that you could plant a hundred olive trees because <laughs> the, the landscape is so stony. Wow. But you know that those grids of stone walls were all built by slaves by. two or three thousand years ago, and yeah. they're never going to go anywhere. No, no. The island has become uninhabited over the centuries, but somebody, lots of people, put in many thousands of hours there. It's kind of sobering yeah. to go by and, and be faced, confronted with that deep, deep history. Well, I, I, I haven't been with you sailing in Croatia, but certainly my experience sailing with you on the French coast with all the little various islands, there, you, we'd, there'd be a monastery on one, a little tiny ancient village on another one where you know, there, was, there wasn't much to do. Um, one, I, I mean, I, I could think of all kinds of fun stories. We, we could probably have this show go on for a couple of hours. <laughs> Thinking of the crazy stories that we've we've had from T-shirts that have walked off of porches. To <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, the French police T-shirt that you had to have. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll 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 tell everybody I was bad. The the it was hanging drying on a on a uh, on a. Uh, um, Clothesline. Clothesline, thank you. Um, up on the porch and uh, just had to have it. So I went up and I, I stole this policeman's t shirt. And he was in there. I, I saw him. He had his feet up <laughs> ticketing an app or something like that. So talk about bad boy. Bad boy. Bad boy. It was probably just a puff of wind that took it away, right? That's, yeah, it really it wasn't me. Been, it just yeah. kind of blew off the porch and landed on my shoulder. And, you know, what could I do? You know, yeah. But, um, yeah, fun times. Croatia is also interesting in other ways. It was ruled by Venice for 500 years. Mm. So the architecture all down the Croatian coast is a real mix of the traditional Croatian uh, styles that predated the Venetians, but also distinctively Italian-looking architecture. Mm. One island, not an island, uh, it's a town on the Istrian Peninsula called Rovinja. And it's a conical town, meaning a very steep cone with a church on top that you can see from 25 miles away. Mm. And these very steep streets that are just pedestrian streets with polished uh, limestone for paving. And the, the town is entirely, the, the conical part is the old town, and it's hundreds and hundreds of years old. When you enter that part of the town, you go through a stone gateway that has the lion uh, icon, which was the mark of the Venetian Empire. Mm. And all the rest of the town is built up much more recently and has modern, very stylish, fancy hotels but this one part of it is ancient and very Italian. And the same is true of Zadar and uh, other big towns down the coast. But then when you get further down to Split, which is one of the biggest towns along the coast, the waterfront of the harbor consists of the Emperor Diocletian's palace. 
Really? Which, which is partly in ruins now, but within the ruins, subsequent centuries of buildings have been built, just like uh, the accretion of a coral reef building on the old ruins. So you'll see uh, a stylish boutique hotel, four or five stories, that has an old half of an arch from Roman days wow. going right into and attached to the hotel. Wow, that's... It, it, it's really stunning. That is really <laughs> exciting. Wow. And I imagine the food is, is, is there real Croatian food or is it something that's very uh, sort of influenced by the Italian? It very much uh, both. The okay. Croatian menu is uh, very fresh seafood, uh, you know, uh, grilled squids I love there, or just being served a whole grilled fish. Mm -hmm. uh, and often when you go to a, a fish restaurant on the sea, they'll just bring a huge platter of fish and you pick the one you want them to grill for you. I'll oh, have that wow. one. And they come back. 20 minutes later with your fish. Wow, that's fantastic. That's and, great. And there are cats around. Oh, at, yeah, at waiting your, for little... <laughs> your feet, waiting for whatever you might want to toss them. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> Very sweet. Helps keep the restaurant grounds clean as a whistle. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, we're down to two minutes. Um, is there anything that... Uh, I, I mean, like I said, we could go on for a long time talking about all the fun stories that we've the f crazy things that have happened, the fun things that we've done. The, but is there anything in, in the last couple of minutes that, that you remember that you'd like to share in particular, either with N not me so or much, with Not so much that, but as I said, we're beginning to think about how to pass the boat on. Mm -hmm. uh, she's been such a stalwart boat. She's unique. There's not another boat to the design anywhere in the world. And yep, there she is again. We want to be sure that whoever takes over for the next chapter of her life understands what he's getting and appreciates it. Right. Uh, so that's very much on my mind these days sure. uh, as we enter our 40th season. Well, congratulations. And thank you. I want to thank you for being my guest today. It's really been special having you here as a, as a dear, dear friend but also sharing um, your, your wonderful knowledge of so many things. And as I said from the beginning, you're kind of a renaissance man. You, 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 you music and sailing and cooking and writing, and you just, you just have a little bit of it all going on. So well, my compliments you. to you. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. And thank you again for being on, on my show today. Uh, I want to thank my guests for tuning into Around the Town uh, with Mark today. It's been a lot of fun, obviously. I've been thrilled to have Bill here. And uh, we'll be having another show soon. And also, I've gotten a lot of great feedback from Nibbling Around Town. And I'll be bringing you another Nibbling Around Town very soon as well. So please watch the schedule, stay tuned, and we'll look forward to seeing you again.